Yes, I, I have, but I'm not sure if we're supposed to be muted or not. Yeah. Seems as though, yes, everybody's been muted. A very good morning to you all. It's good to welcome you to our morning worship during uh, the summer. Uh, it's good to welcome you. Obviously, lots of people away. So we do things slightly differently. But just to say, there is a crèche through that door there, and the service is streamed through there as well. Um, so if you've got preschool children, is this have got some feedback if we have so if you have some preschool children go through there the children uh, during summer uh, will do various things today they're going to go uh, primary age children are going to go up with Linda and they're going to have a bit of fun and watch a video as well up there so slightly different but you are very welcome I just want to begin by thinking of the story of Mary and Martha during Holiday Club, we did this story with the children, and they had a spot the difference. So I don't know whether any of them can remember the spot the difference and to see the differences in this story. But let me read this story to you as we begin our service together. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What a lovely story of this figure, Martha, who opened her home to Jesus. She welcomed Jesus into her home. She wanted him there. But even though she wanted him there, she got distracted. The Greek literally is pulled apart. Pulled in all directions. I don't know as you come to church this morning, do you feel pulled in all directions, distracted from actually even being here? We're called the age of distraction. We're called the age of distraction, where these things beep all the time at us, where we can't focus on one thing or the other. Companies selling us things are dedicated to distract and addict us so that we cannot focus on anything important. They tell me in the year 2000, we had an attention span of 12 seconds. Now, they say it's eight seconds. 
And can anyone remember what the attention span of a goldfish is? They have a memory of nine seconds. So actually, we're even doing worse than goldfish. We are in that age of distraction. Pulled in all directions. Martha, we read, she was worried. The word worried in the Greek is, is a similar word to the word we use to meditate. In other words, she was worried. She was mulling over things, constantly thinking about her issues and her problems. She was constantly mulling them over in her mind. As you come to church, what's going through that mind of yours? What are you worried about? She was upset, worried and upset. The Greek word upset is a, a noise, a roar. And we often come to church with noise and roar going on in our mind. And as we come to church, I want to challenge you. You've come here, hopefully, because you want to find out more about Jesus or you want to get to know Jesus better. But the problem is, like Martha... Many of us come distracted, many of us come worried and upset about many things. And many of us come this morning into the presence of Jesus with that phrase of Martha, don't you care? Don't you care what's going on in my life? Don't you care about all I've got to do? Don't you care about my family issues? Don't you care? And Jesus comes to us and calls our name and says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. And as we come, we need to learn that the beginning of devotion is attention. We need to learn that Mary sat at Jesus' feet, not distracted, not pulled in all directions, not with a noise or uproar in her mind, not mulling over her worries or her concerns, but simply sitting at the feet of Jesus. And that is what I invite you to this morning. I invite you to know that Jesus does care about all that's going on out there. But actually, right now, only one thing is needed. To believe that Jesus is here. And to sit at his feet seeing he is the Lord. He is the one we need to hear. He is the one we need to give attention to. And let us just still ourselves from all the distractions, all the worries, all the upsets, and come and sit at the feet of Jesus. And one way we do that is by worship. And we're going to worship in a minute. But another way we do that is just by stilling our hearts and minds and by praying. So I invite you this morning to sit at the feet of Jesus. The one thing that is required so let's just take a moment and however hard we find it, let's be quiet, let's close our eyes, let's still our hearts and our minds and let us recognise the presence of Jesus. And if you're watching on Zoom at home, it is a greater challenge. A greater challenge not to be distracted. So whether you're in here, in the building, or at home, make sure your mobiles are on silent. Make sure the phone is off the hook. Make sure the door is closed. And let us come and sit at the feet of Jesus.
Lord Jesus, thank you that as we gather in your name, you are here. We open our lives to you. We open our church to you. And we come to do the one thing that is required and to listen to you and to worship you and to honour you. And as we pray, as we sing, as we listen to your word, may we know that we are in the company of Jesus and we have given him our full attention so that our devotion to him might increase. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship that Jesus with the breath that he has given us today. You give life, you are love, you bring life to
Thank you, Jesus, that you call us to be Mary's, Lord. You call us to just sit at your feet. And Lord, so much I feel like a Martha. Lord, but I thank you that when we do that, it's not wasted. Lord, help us all to sit at your feet. Not just this morning, but when we go from here, Lord. Would we hear the call on our hearts and our lives this week? Thank you, Jesus.
out the great things God has done for you. What you've come here this morning, you just want to say thank you. You've done some great things and I want to thank you. Just speak those out as your worship today. Lord, we declare you have done great things, but we also declare that you are above it all. And whatever we are going through, whatever storms we are facing right now, we declare hallelujah. You are above it all. You are seated and you reign and you are with us. And as we sit at your feet, you bless us, you encourage us, you strengthen us. You give us wisdom, you give us help, and you lead us through. Lord Jesus, come to us now as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Just um, want to take a few minutes uh, slightly differently than normal. I hope that's okay, because God has done great things in some situations and people's lives. And we just want to share that. The first people I want to come up is Ian and Sheila. Do you want to come up and join me? Is that all right? Yes, not really, she says, but I put her on the spot. So um, we're, we're, we're going to bring them up forward because I was so busy with Holiday Club uh, last week that I forgot something really special happened in the lives of this lovely couple. Do you want to tell me what you have just celebrated? We celebrated our son's wedding, which is 60 years, um, on the 28th of July. <laughs> 60 years. And I think both of them, I know them, I haven't asked them, but I know that they would want to thank the Lord for keeping them through those 60 years and just want to thank him for their lives together. I'm sure that that's the case, am I right? Absolutely. Brilliant. Yes. Um, they've also brought some cake to share with us, but I have to say it contains almonds, doesn't it? Is that what I have to say? Well, it's got almond paste on, so... Almond paste on, so... So if you're, you're not, so, uh, but yeah. But yeah, so 60 years, what's the Lord meant to you through that time? How long have you been part of this church, for those who don't know? We came in 1972. 1972, yes. so that's 50 years. I know, I was born in 1972, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, one of, my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters said to me um, around Christmas time when we were out walking, Granny, can I ask you something? So I said, yes. So she said, what does Christianity mean to you? Aww. So all I could say, just on the spur of the moment, was, well, it's everything, really, for us. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And it's we, been... We met in a church, and um, we continued to be in various, well, not various churches. We were in Uganda for a few years, so we were in a different church there. And then we came here... <laughs> well, let's. Can I pray for you both? Yes, please. And thank Jesus for this amazing work in their lives over these last 60 years. Lord Jesus, we bring Ian and Sheila up to you up on this stage on this Sunday as an act of worship and an act of gratitude. 
Because, Lord, we want to thank you for all you have done in their lives. We want to give you the praise and honour for 60 years of marriage. We want to give you the praise and honour for, for how for 50 years they have served you in this church together and blessed many of us at various times. But, Lord, we want to look to you and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your work in this amazing couple. And Lord, we thank you that you haven't finished with them yet and you'll continue to work in their lives. You'll continue bring them closer to each other and closer to others. You will use them to bless their children and their grandchildren. You'll use them to bless us. And for that, we are grateful. So Lord Jesus, continue your work in their lives until you bring them complete before your presence, sanctified wholly before your sight on that great and awesome day of that great wedding that lies ahead, the great wedding of the church with Christ, where we will all celebrate together. Bless them, I pray, and thank you so much for your work in their lives. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. Now, for someone, I'm going to move quickly, some more great things God has done, from someone who's been 50 years in the church to someone who's been here less than 50 days. So, Victoria, do you want to come and join me? Now, Victoria, tell us where you come from. And when did you arrive in England? How many days ago? Let me, uh, it is less than 50, isn't it? 17th of July. 17th of July. And what a journey it took to come here. Uh, how long did it take you to travel from there to Poland? It takes me four days to travel from my city to Poland because it was traffic jams all over and uh, a lot of things. Uh, that's uh, because of we, what we need to move slowly yeah you listen to ask her the story it is truly remarkable how god led you isn't it and how yes. you uh, didn't have took certain routes that you probably weren't aware of and uh, amazing so it's great but tell her this up here is a picture of your church yes. what's the name of your church um name of my church is house of gospel the house of gospel and it's a Baptist church, and your dad is the pastor there, one of the two yes, pastors. one of the pastors, yes. So, and tell us a little bit about the situation there, what they're doing, and how they're helping. Uh, as when the war started, and um, we understand that we need to change our, all our ministries in our church, and there were one slogan that we usually uh, he heard from a lot of pastors in Ukraine, they said that, the church that doesn't help in the period of war will not need it uh, by people in the face time. So we decided to um, make ser service for people, uh, for, for refugees. We had now four ministries. Um, uh, the first one is for, for people who come from occupied territory or just who lost their homes. And they could come to our church um, Sometimes they just sleep in church. Sometimes uh, we, we take a lot of people to our houses, but there are not enough places for them. So um, at the first time uh, when the war just started, there were a hundred people who lived just in church. Um, now uh, there are much more or less more of them lived in houses and there are only five people who live now in church. Um, and um, we also have a special um, days for refugees. Uh, usually twice a week when they could come to our church, take humanitarian aid, take medications and just talk to, with people about what happened in their life and because sometimes it's a terrible story and they just need to talk with somebody. Um, but th those of us who are poor in our geography, your city is near the front line because you're on the south of the country. Yes. How far are the Russians? Um, the front line is in 20 kilometers from our city. So in miles, I think it would be a little bit less, like 15 miles. 
So it's not really far from us. So it's really good. We're going to show you a short video, I think, to give you an idea. Stay, don't move, but you can. A short video um, of some of the things the church have been up to in supporting uh, the refugees coming in. As I say, they slept at the church to start with, but then they've been supporting uh, them in other ways. Technology allowing. This is a good test in your Ukrainian as well, okay? The church. Oh, that was her dad, I think, wasn't it? At the front. And all these people are just refugees, and they're members of our church. They usually uh, just sit at the place when they could be interviewed. See, that's her dad. So don't get too sad. <laughs> And then hit, and, and what's going on here, Vic, do you want to start? Girls from our church, he's a nurse, so she just gave the medication, and here people give Bibles to people. Um, there are some uh, children's Bibles, uh, like that one. And you were telling um, me there's a real interest in finding faith. Yes, yes, a lot of people now just thinking about what would happen with them after that, so a lot of them comes and try to find Jesus. And this is our second floor, which now more like a uh, shop, uh, not like shop, but like uh, places where people can take clothes. So um, usually we had lunch there, but now <laughs> it's like that. Um, and um, there are some lists when you can see when people writing something. It's usually some needs that people have and we haven't got them in church. So we just make a list of them to find somewhere. Um, okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so that's a little bit of an idea of what's going on in her <laughs> church back home. And I just want to pray. And as I said to Victoria yesterday, I don't believe in coincidences with God. And I believe that God has brought Victoria here. Her story, how she got here, is truly remarkable. If you want to ask her, I hope she'll be willing to tell you, though it is a bit traumatic. Um, but her story brought here is amazing. But we believe God has brought her here. So therefore, we are praying through how we can support that church and how we can support them in their ministry right near the front line in any way we can so uh, we're going to try and work that through over the coming weeks and months to see what we can do but we want to say thank you to god for bringing victoria safely here it was an interesting can i tell them uh, she was telling me that the decision she was a difficult to decision whether to leave or come uh, she's just completed how many years at medical school Five years at medical school. She's got one more year to go, um, which she's going to try and do online and try and get some practical experience around here. But she had the difficult decision and they sat down as a family and they prayed what was the right thing to do. And you wrote three options on bits of paper and then they prayed. And before God, they then chose one. And that was one for you to leave. And that must have been really tough. But actually, we believe God's brought you here for a reason, and we want to honour that, and we want to see God use you to bless your family back home by coming here in many ways. Is that all right? Can I pray for you? Is that all right? Lord Jesus, we thank you for Victoria. We thank you for bringing her here. And Lord, we don't believe that's a coincidence. The way we hear her story, how you have led her, led her from home, led her through a very traumatic journey and brought her here to live in this area. We believe your hand is upon her life because she is your child. Lord, we pray that nothing she's been through will harm her or scar her emotionally and she will be well and strong and be able to support others. 
And we pray as she becomes part of this church for this season, may we work in partnership with her and her church in Ukraine to be a blessing, to be Jesus to as many people as we can. Those who are looking into city, finding out about Jesus, those who need practical support, may you use us through Victoria, through her parents to bless many in Ukraine. So Lord, here we are sitting at your feet, listening to what you might be saying to us through this situation. But we thank you for Victoria. May she feel at home. May you bless her and encourage her in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. So do introduce yourself more to Victoria. And finally, sorry, I know there's lots of people. Rhonda, do you want to quickly come up? Uh, because uh, what are you doing this week, Rhonda? So, oh gosh, that's loud. <laughs> so this week, so we are taking nine young people up to um, an a, event, a big youth gathering in Peterborough, at Peterborough Showground, and it's called Satellites, and it's a little bit like Soul Survivor, but it's not completely, I've been told. <laughs> So it's been supported by the leadership of Soul Survivor, but it has its own identity. And um, we are really excited to be taking nine of our young people up. We also have Toby and Joseph, who are going to be serving at Satellites. And we have four, four leaders, yes. <laughs> um, Gordon, Linda, Paul, and myself that are going to be there as well. So... Um, we would, we're very excited, and I saw Luke somewhere, where's Luke, is he there? Got his head down. <laughs> um, I hope Luke's excited, but no, we're really excited. Um, so just prayers for all the practical stuff, I still feel like I've got this much stuff to do, and waking up early with it going through my mind, um, so I'd really appreciate your prayers for practical stuff, for safety, with minibuses and everything, for driving, it's going to be a hot week so that we would, uh, yeah, we'd cope with the heat. Um, strength for the leaders. I would appreciate, uh, Gordon and I would appreciate, I think, prayers. We are leading a workshop there. We're leading a dance and spoken word workshop. So we would really value your prayers for that. Um, and mostly that, uh, apart from all the fun that we have and good relationships, that um, it would just be such a special time where our young people uh, meet Jesus in a very special way and lives are changed. Brilliant. And I've, can I just say one more? Not all our young people are going to satellites and I just wanted to remember them. And they are all doing different things this summer. Some are going to scripture union things, some are doing just general holiday things. So please remember them in your prayers as well. You get Tuesday and come back next Sunday. Yep. Yes. Well, let, let's pray. There's a, a mixed group going, some who have no faith, some who have faith. We want to pray that those who have no faith, when they come back, will have faith. And those, whatever they are, will take their next step in their journey. But let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this event. We thank you for our young people going on this event. We pray you'll keep them safe, you'll keep them well. We pray that they will ultimately encounter the risen Lord Jesus and their lives will be transformed forever. So just bless them, those who don't have a church background, may they be able to slot in and, and really sense something of your presence. And Lord, just watch over them. And for the leaders, give them wisdom as they care for these young people, and just give them the wisdom from heaven that they need. So we just pray this week for them, and for all our young people in all their journeys of faith, may this summer be significant that they may learn to sit at the feet of Jesus and know his love and care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brilliant. Thank you for listening. The children are now going to go with Linda uh, to their class, and I think there'll be refreshments upstairs. Do remember there is a crash through in the schoolroom if you need. But we're going to worship together as we declare the goodness of God, as we declare that... Whatever we've been through, whether it's through a war in our home country, whether it's through 60 years of marriage, or whatever we're going through now, that God's goodness is with us. And we just declare and sit at his feet. So let's worship together as we sing goodness of God.
since then I have wanted to make that journey but circumstances of life it's never happened and um, we visited John and Barbara who some of you remember and um, were come to this church some years ago they moved away some years ago we visited them a few weeks ago and uh, in the process we also met my cousin who lives near them and they go to the same church and uh, my cousin shared that they were going to Israel in September and I said oh I said I'm really jealous it's something I've always wanted to do Anyway, when we got back from the weekend, I had a message from my cousin. She said, somebody's dropped out, there's one place left. And somebody else felt that it was right to give us a certain amount of money towards that trip. It's all fallen into place so far. It's booked, it's paid for. I would really value specific prayer for um, COVID protection for me. Uh, and John, obviously, um, and I need to sort out some sort of care um, for John as well while I'm away. But, you know, God is faithful, and he has given me one of the desires of my heart, and I just honour him for that. Thank you. Sometimes it takes a long time sitting at Jesus' feet to hear and get the answer we want. It's exam results season coming up. Sorry to bring that back to your attention, Toby. Um, 
results are coming up. But I did want to say that actually often it's more stressful for teachers than it is pupils. As a teacher, as many of you know, I was a teacher before I was a minister, and one of the most disheartening things you will ever do is to mark exam papers. Because having taught a group for so long, you hope that they have learned something. I remember in my first year of teaching, I had this particularly bottom set year nine group with a group of girls who really just couldn't see the point of doing chemistry. So I worked really hard with them, got alongside them, encouraged them. And when we got to the end of year exam, I thought they're going to learn something. They came up with these difficult chemistry questions and their answers were, I still remember it to this day, banana, lemon and orange. <laughs> and I just went, what have I done? for this whole year, because it's so disheartening. I think if the technology allies, I always therefore find some of these answers quite funny of people that they put on their exam script, um, I, particularly those who aren't good at maths, uh, you may uh, appropriate with how you expand, oh, back to the other one, we missed it. How you expand equations, um, how you find x, well it didn't go missing, did it, in the first place. And as the chemist ex briefly explained what hard water is, ice, okay. Not quite the answer, even if you think that's a good answer, that's not really what hard water is. So it's really frustrating when you don't, people don't learn a lesson. But I, what I want to tell you is I want to do a, a spot the difference. I want to do a compare because actually when we look at Mary and Martha, they are great students because they actually learned. They actually learned from their time with Jesus. They learned with him because there is another incident where Mary and Martha are having a meal for Jesus. And we can find that in John chapter 12. Let me read it to you because this is the same Mary and Martha putting on a meal for Jesus. Again, it's only a few verses, so let me read it to you. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Here we have... Mary and Martha. And as it were, I want you to picture, and I could only find these kids' pictures, I want you to picture these two scenes. Scene one, which we read at the beginning of the service, Mary and Martha with Jesus. Just picture it in your mind. Martha scaring around, saying, Jesus don't care, Get wanting her sister to do it. Jesus sitting there and Mary at her feet. Scene one. Scene two, we are now in Bethany probably at their home, though the gospel writers say it's the home of Simon the leper, but we can come on to that later. They were putting on a meal again for Jesus. Now picture in your mind that scene. What is the difference between the two scenes? What is the difference? Spot the difference. And can I suggest, as we look at these two scenes, there are a number of differences. The first, we read that they came to give this meal in Jesus' honour. 
So ultimately, this is about the worship and honour of Jesus. So unlike the previous, where, where Martha just opened her home to Jesus as not a believer, as someone who was just interested and intrigued about Jesus, we now have them learning. They now have come to honour Jesus. But what's the biggest spot the difference between these two scenes? What's the biggest spot the difference? What is missing from scene one that is in scene two? Or who is missing from scene one who is in scene two? Lazarus. Lazarus. So the first thing I want us to think about is Lazarus. Where was Lazarus in the first scene? He was their brother. They lived together. Where was he? In modern day language, perhaps he was in his room playing on his PlayStation or on Instagram. He wasn't bothered that Jesus was in the house. He's nowhere to be seen. He's not part of the picture of scene one. There is no Lazarus. We now find in this honour of Jesus, we find Lazarus. And I want to suggest that all of us are Lazarus. All of us begin with not being interested in Jesus at all. Most of us are interested in coming to church. Most of us aren't interested in this person, Jesus. We're not even on the scene. But what caused Lazarus to be on the scene? What caused him to be not interested, to being interested and being on the table with Jesus? What happened? It's obvious he was raised to life. The thing about Lazarus is he wasn't interested in Jesus, but Jesus raised him to life. Lazarus was raised again. And can I suggest, we all need to be Lazarus. We all need to recognise there is a point where we're not interested in Jesus. We're not concerned about him. In fact, if he came, we'd be upstairs doing something else. We wouldn't even be on the scene. But there becomes a point where Jesus comes to us, where we are not physically dead, but we know that we are spiritually dead. And Jesus comes and speaks to our life. He speaks our name and we come to life again. And if you haven't had that experience, you may not be in this picture at all. You need to know, Jesus, speak your name. Know he loves you, he cares about you. He knows that you are away from him. You are dead to him. There is no spiritual life in you, but he wants to still call your name and give you life. Not only does he want to raise you from the dead, Lazarus came out of the tomb, and we read in John 12, and you can, sorry, you can read this story in John 11 in the chapter before. You can read as he came out of the tomb, he was still bound, and Jesus, Jesus said, untie him, unbind him. Because the second thing about Lazarus we need to identify with, not only to have spiritual life, we need to be free from the things that bind us. We need to be free from the past that has held us captive, that has bound us. We need to be set free from the sins, from the temptations, as we've looked at over the last few weeks, the things done to us as well as the things we've done. We need to know freedom. And Jesus comes to set us free free. And the third thing we need to know about Lazarus is that we need to have life, we need to be freed, but we also need to know where is Lazarus in this scene. Lazarus lived whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Lazarus, verse 2, was among those reclining at the table with him. Lazarus was seated with Christ. And the Bible tells us that when we put our faith in Jesus, when he gives us life, when he sets us free, we are then, Paul tells us, seated in the heavenlies with Christ. We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Nothing can take that away from you. Nothing can take that away from you. You are with Christ. And when he comes again or when he calls you home, you will be with Christ forever. In the story in, uh, Ma, in Luke, when the Mary and Martha, what does Jesus say about Mary to Martha? And no one can take that away from her. 
There are lots of things that be, can be taken away from you. We all know that in this world. There are lots of things that we hanker after, that we want, that we desire, but ultimately can be taken away from us. But here we see in Lazarus that, and in Mary that there is something that cannot be taken away when we are seated with Christ, and that will last for eternity. So can I wonder whether you are Lazarus? Perhaps you've come to church and you're not even in the scene. You don't even know about Jesus. You're not really that interested. But yet, we want you to be in this picture. We want you to know that Jesus comes to you and he speaks your name and he knows your name and he wants to give you life. He wants to set you free from the things you've done and the things done to you. And he wants to know that you are seated with Christ. And no one and nothing, not even hell itself, can take that from you. That's Lazarus. Hashtag Lazarus. Please, follow me. Hashtag Lazarus. Here the call. Hear Jesus calling your name, coming back to life, be free and be seated. But it is a life transformation. Because Lazarus is ultimately the witness. And when you've been given new life, when you've been set free, when you've been seated with Jesus, it changes you, it transforms you, and you become a witness. Did the end verse that I read to you, did it shock you? Have you actually ever read this before? So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. When you are raised to life by Jesus, when you are set free by Jesus, when you are seated in the heavenly realms, it does not mean that life is easy. You have to stand above the parapet, as it were, and say, I am a follower of Jesus. He raised me to life. I want to honour him with my life. He set me free. I am seated with him. This is something I publicly declare and will witness to and actually people may misunderstand family members may not get it people may stop being my friend people may ridicule me people may reject me because when we witness to resurrection to freedom and to eternal life some people are offended some people don't get it. So don't be surprised. Hashtag Lazarus. It can be hard. And some of you here might have to tell family members who won't like you. Some of you might have to publicly declare, and baptism is the place where we publicly declare our allegiance to Jesus. And some people won't like it. Some people won't get it. Some people will refuse to acknowledge it. But if we truly have been raised to life, if we truly have been freed, do you think Lazarus minded? Do you think Lazarus wanted to keep it quiet? I doubt it, because he had life. Secondly, hashtag Lazarus, hashtag Martha. Martha learned her lesson. Martha learned her lesson. What's the difference between Martha scene one and Martha scene two? Here we read it. Where, let me read it. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at a table with him. Only thing said about Martha in that passage. What's the difference? no moaning, there is no complaining, there's no comparing, there's just honouring, there's just serving. 
The word serve, both in Luke's Gospel and here in John, is that word diakonos, the idea that we serve, where we get our deacons in Baptist Church Live from, those who serve. There is nothing wrong in serving. There is nothing wrong in acting and serving and doing. Don't get that from the story of Mary and Martha, because here we have Martha, who is a servant, who loves doing. She comes here and she honours Jesus by serving. She honours Jesus by putting on this meal. She honours Jesus by getting stuck in and getting active. There is nothing wrong in service. Service, as someone once said, is love dressed in work clothes. And that's Martha, the love of Jesus now she had. Not, she hadn't just opened her home to Jesus, she now loved Jesus. And therefore her service was love dressed in work clothes. She honoured Jesus by putting on this meal. She ran around as mad as before, but this time she was doing it willingly and joyfully and delightfully. And she didn't care what Lazarus was doing and she didn't care what Mary was doing because she was doing this for Jesus. Do you get that? There's a one Hebrew word uh, for worship called Avadar. And it's used a number of times and it's used in the place of work where God rested from his Avadar, his work. But then there's an interesting thing where Moses says to the Egypt as he wants to free him, he says, let my people go so they can work me. The same word, Avadar, because part of our service, part of our work is our love, is our adoration, is our worship. If you are a doer, if you love doing things, that's all right. Just make sure you're doing it to honour Jesus. Not to be looked good, not for applause, not because it has to be done and no one else is going to do it. Do our service out of Remember the story of Jacob? Got cheated into his first wife, but he really loved Rachel. So he had to work a further seven years for her. What does it say? It says something like, and they were like day. They were nothing to him. Because of love. Because of love. If you were doing things and serving for Jesus, how can you tell if you're doing it to honour Jesus? Are you being like Martha in the first scene, complaining about why aren't everyone else doing it? Why isn't everyone else helping? Why can't they do that? That's not worship. That's not love. Whereas if you're doing it with your eyes fixed on Jesus, then I don't care what anyone else does. I'm serving Jesus. Hashtag Lazarus the witness, hashtag Martha the worker. And then we come on to hashtag Mary. And we hear, see here Mary the worshipper. And let's not get this wrong. That though Lazarus learnt, though Martha learnt, Mary also learnt. And Mary, once again, goes top of the class. The other Gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, even say that. They say what she has done will be proclaimed as long as the Gospel is. There is something that Mary has done in worship that actually defines what we are meant to be. Yes, we're meant to be uh, uh, Lazarus. We're meant to know new life. We're meant to know uh, that we're free and we're meant to know we're seated to be with Christ. Hashtag Lazarus. Yes, that's you and me. Hashtag Martha. We're called to serve. We're called to love Jesus in our service. But ultimately, hashtag Mary, we are called to be worshippers. There is one uh, Hebrew word for worship which talks about service. There are at least nine others which talk about worship, using your bodies, prostrating, kneeling, raising your hands, 
playing instrument. Because there is something about worshipping Jesus that is what we're called to. John is reminded of that when Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, the, the Father is looking for worshippers. Looking for worshippers. So as we come and see this incident, I just want to think about who we worship, how we worship, and why we worship. The third thing we see is that Mary took this half litre pure nard, about 25,000, 30,000 pounds equivalent money. She took this perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Why did she do this? Judas complains, that money could have been used for something else. But she opened up this jar, she cracked open the bottle and she poured it on Jesus' feet. If, like me, you think the account in Matthew and Mark is this, the same incident, then we read that he was anointed with his head. But this was a, a, a can of Pepsi, if you would like, and uh, you wouldn't pour it all on a head and no doubt you'd have poured some on the head, on, on the body and on the feet. So here we have this anointing of Jesus, the who. Why did Mary do this? What was this act of worship and love about? The first reason she did it is the obvious reason. Why did she do it? She'd just seen Jesus raise her brother to life. Her brother had died Jesus had raised her to life. And she was grateful. I expect, actually, my guess is that Lazarus, Mary and Martha owned this bottle of perfume. And perhaps it was something they decided to do together as a way of honouring Jesus. A way of bringing something to Jesus. Out of gratitude. Out of thanksgiving. Because the first thing about worship is we need to know who we worship. And we worship the one who was raised from death and the one who gives life to us all. Worship begins by acknowledging Jesus as the resurrection and the life. The one who conquered death and the one who gives us eternal life. And that should cause us to want to worship him. Also recognising that he is the one who raises the dead, but also the one who will go and reign for eternity. Jesus says, you won't always have the poor, you, you will always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me with you. This idea that this Jesus is someone who is not like you and me. He is the one who raised to life, he raises the dead, he gives us eternal life, and he is the one who comes from heaven and is now reigning and glorified in heaven. Who is it that we worship? We worship Jesus, the one who ra was raised to life, the one who gives us eternal life, and the one who is now seated in heaven, reigning and glorious. He is the one we worship. And what did Mary do? She took the perfume. She poured it over Jesus' head, body, and as John tells us, her, his feet. Why does John tell us the feet? And then what did she do? This is weird. This is very weird. She then took her hair wiped his feet with her hair. Yes, it's weird. It's not normal. It's unusual. Don't do it. Why did she do it? Because there is something about Jesus. His holiness, his beauty, his divinity. That even the dirtiest part of his body, his feet, were more holy and pure than the cleanest part of her, her head. She understood something of the glory and beauty and majesty 
of this man who was God. And she took the cleanest part of her body and saw the dirtiest part of his, and his dirtiest was cleaner than her cleanest. It's like when you saw that England, well done women for winning the European Championship. The last time the men did it, if you ever saw it, because it was a really, really long time ago, when uh, Bobby Moore went to the Queen to take the trophy, you see what he's doing. He's rubbing his hands on his shirt. And he was asked once, why did you do that? He said, I've been playing football for 120 minutes. My hands were grubby. I was walking up. I saw the trophy. And then I saw the Queen in her prestigious white gloves. And I thought, I'm going to have to shake that hand with my dirt and sweat and grime. That's what's going on here. She saw the beauty of this God-man and saw that her cleanest part of a body was the only thing she could use to dry his feet, who she worshipped. And when we come to worship Jesus, we need to know who. We also need to know how to worship. Judas complained. And Jesus said, you will not always have the poor among you, but you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. We're told here that Judas didn't really care about the poor. He just cared about the money. And why was Mary able to worship this way? Why was she uh, to show her gratitude in such lavish, extravagant way, such sacrificial and such public way? Because her heart was fully focused on Jesus. Judas, his heart was focused on money. His focus was, look at that jar of perfume. That must be worth at least £30,000. Cool, what could I do with £30,000? His heart was focused on the money. Mary wasn't about the money. Wasn't about what it would look like her drying someone's feet with her hair. It was all about her heart, a heart of love heart of gratitude, a heart that would be prepared to do anything, a heart that would sacrifice everything for this person. And it was public. We read the smell, fragrance filled the whole house. Because worship needs to be from the heart. It needs to touch our emotions. It needs to be filled with gratitude. It needs to be lavish, sacrificial, and public. That's how we show our love for Jesus. Do you know what? Some people think it's really weird that we come to church, we gather on a Sunday morning, and we sing songs, and we raise our hands, and some of us even jig a bit. Some of us think that's really, really weird. But ultimately, it's an attitude of the heart. Because we love Jesus. We are so thankful that he's giving us life. And we're prepared to sacrifice anything for the one who sacrificed himself for us. And we don't care who sees it or knows. We want it to fill this whole church building. We want it to fill this whole town. We want to fill our whole country and our whole world that everyone will know that Jesus is the one who gives life. Jesus is the one who frees. Jesus is the one who is seated at the hand of God, the God who was man and who is now reigning on high. We worship him and we want to do it publicly so that everyone knows. Who, how and why? Why do we worship? Why do we come week by week and offer our worship of our bodies, of our songs, of our attention? Why do we do it? There's an interesting phrase which is very difficult to translate because it doesn't make much sense in the Greek. We read, uh, we read this. Uh, if I can find it. Verse 7, leave her alone, Jesus replied to Judas. It was intended that she should save this perfume 
for the day of my burial. It was intended that she should literally keep this for the day of my burial. Hang on a minute. Don't make sense, does it? She just poured it all out. She heard that. I mean, she's there trying to sweep it all up again and get it again. How is she going to keep it? But actually, it's not the perfume I think Jesus is talking about here. What she's got to keep, what she's got to keep is the belief in the resurrection, belief that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, to keep it no matter what, to keep it even when Jesus hung on that cross, to keep it even when the darkness appeared, to keep it even when his body was taken from the cross, to keep it even when he was put in a tomb and the stone rolled across, to keep it when that guard of soldiers was put in front of the tomb, to keep Keep it on that Easter day morning when they went to the tomb and the stone had been rolled away and there was no body to keep believing. And that's why worship needs to be kept. That's why we worship to remind ourselves that Jesus is the one who is the resurrection and the life. And therefore, if we want to worship, we worship firstly because we believe that belief in Jesus' resurrection from the dead is where our salvation comes from. The thing that we need to believe if we are going to have faith in Jesus, if we're going to be resurrected, if we're going to be freed, if we're going to have life, is to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says this, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we believe he's God, and if we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We have to keep believing in the resurrection of Jesus. No resurrection, no Christianity. It is the resurrection of Jesus, and therefore our resurrection, that comes from that. That's why <coughs> we worship, because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus. It's about our salvation, but we also worship because it's about our sanctification. It's about us growing and changing in the midst of difficult circumstances. Because how were they going to cope when Jesus was crucified, when Jesus was arrested? How can you keep going when things get tough, when life gets difficult? You need to keep on believing in the resurrection of Jesus. You need to keep on believing that he's alive. You need to keep on believing that you need to keep coming to sit at his feet and listen to him. You need to keep coming to worship him in the presence of others. When life gets difficult, and it will, as it did for Mary, as it did for Martha, as it did for Lazarus, as their best friend was imprisoned and arrested and flogged and tortured and crucified. When life gets tough, Keep believing in the resurrection. Keep believing Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And know that you can still sit at his feet every day and listen and learn from him. And ultimately we keep on worshipping because it's about our salvation, it's about our sanctification. But it's also about the second coming. It's also about Jesus coming again. Because about his, kept for his burial, his resurrection, that he was raised to life, never to die again. And he is coming again. Jesus is coming as Lord. He is coming as Saviour. And he is coming to get rid of all death and dying and sickness and sadness, and brokenness, and injustice. Keep on believing that the resurrection of Jesus means that he's coming again. And he's going to put all wrongs right. And we're going to be part of his kingdom. That's why we worship. 
to remember that the resurrection of Jesus is about why we are saved and we have new life, to allow our sanctification so that we keep on worshipping and keep on believing and keep on trusting whatever life throws at us. And actually we keep on worshipping because we're looking forward to that day when Jesus comes again, when we, like him, will defeat death and mortality and will be raised immortal. Mary got it. Hashtag Mary. Time has gone, I could say, a lot more. But where are you in this story? Spot yourself. Hashtag Lazarus. Are you hearing Jesus call you? Do you want him to give you life? Do you want him to free you? Do you want to know you have eternal life? Respond as he calls your name. Hashtag Martha. You do great serving Jesus. You do lots for him in the church, in the world, in the community, in your family. But is it really honouring Jesus? Is it part of your worship? Or are you grumbling and moaning, saying, don't you care, God? I'm doing all this and they're not doing anything. That's not honouring. That's not worship. Offer yourself Finally, are you hashtag Mary? And worship as you see Lord Jesus. It must be time to end because obviously my battery has gone on my microphone. There we are. I'm sure you've turned that down deliberately to make sure I finish up. But that's a good place to finish. I'm going to bring the musicians up and we're going to worship together as we respond. As we respond to Jesus in worship and as we respond to his word maybe you just need to respond and use these songs and just worship from your heart and just to say Jesus I believe again I believe in you I believe I'm hearing you speak and call my name again and I'm going to witness for you I'm going to tell other people that I've accepted Jesus Maybe by telling someone today that I believe or by saying, coming to me and saying, I am going to be baptised. Maybe you're going to work her. God's calling you to work and serve. Not because it's needed, not because others aren't doing it, but simply because you love Jesus. Or are you just going to worship him? Give him your heart. Perhaps use your body for the first time in worship. Perhaps you've never raised your arm. Perhaps you've never uh, used your voice sung out as loud as you can. Perhaps you haven't danced. Whatever it is. Perhaps you haven't kneeled. Use worship. Don't worry about those around. Let's just allow the worship of Jesus to fill this place. As we finish with these two songs together, let's worship that Jesus.
Amen. What a happy day. Please be seated. I just leave you with the final thought. I haven't been your teacher today, hopefully. Hopefully you've been giving attention to Jesus. The question is, like Mary, Martha and Lazarus, have you learned something? And is something going to change? Are you going to do something? Are you going to be different? Do something different as a result of sitting at the feet of Jesus. I don't get to read your exam paper. You'll be pleased to know. But there is someone who will. Have you learned? And will you now go and act on it? If you'd value prayer, we do have a prayer ministry team. If you want someone to pray and uh, solidify what God's saying to you or you want to respond, someone will be delighted to pray with you. So I'm not around the next two weeks, but have a fantastic holiday, those of you going away. Uh, those of you who are still carrying on, worshipping, do come along uh, in the next couple of weeks. Again, there'll be creche and Sunday school as usual. Uh, but do come and make this part of your listening to Jesus, worshipping him and offering yourselves to him. God bless you. Do stay for refreshments. It's been good to have some visitors from Devon. Hope uh, really good to have with you. And Jessica, back again. She's doing a placement here, uh, but from Scotland. Um, you've met Victoria. Colette's here. New people around. So just make everyone feel welcome. There's tea and uh, coffee uh, and refreshments. You don't need to rush off, but we hope to see you all again soon. God bless you. <laughs>